things. Well, let's open the Word of God, shall we? Uh, is, your, is your Bible just falling open there automatically now? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 14. We are living in this verse this week. I trust you'll continue to live in it long after the meeting is done. We certainly have not exhausted it. It's the Word of God. Look at 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. Paul has taken pen in hand from the city of Philippi where he was laboring in the gospel. And he's written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit now a second letter to the church at Corinth. Corinth was a place of cheap substitutes. I wish I could take you to Corinth. I wish I could put you in a time capsule and take you back 2,000 years and halfway around the world and just drop you, bloop, right in the middle of Corinth. And let you look around for a minute at all of the idolatry and all the immorality and all the wickedness and all the worldliness. And then right in the middle of that, to see the reality and the substance that Jesus Christ brings into a life. It's powerful. Paul writes to those believers living in a wicked time, in a wicked place. By the way, God's designed it so that you can live the Christian life even in the midst of very difficult times. And the church at Corinth is proof of that. And they weren't perfect. They were far from it. They didn't have perfect circumstances. But they have what we have. They have a perfect God. And here they come. Can you see them? Two men walking along. They've got a scroll all rolled up under their arms somewhere. One of them is a fellow by the name of Titus. Maybe you've heard of him. His companion, a fellow by the name of Luke. They arrive at the church at Corinth. They unroll that giant scroll. You know, we take a lot for granted. You've got a nice Bible on your lap there. You get to open up and find your place in. We probably have multiple copies of the Word of God, but they didn't have that in that day. And they pull out this giant scroll that we now call the book of 2 Corinthians, but it was a letter, a personal letter, a Holy Spirit-inspired letter, and they read it. They, they start in chapter 1, verse number 1, Paul unto the church at Corinth, and they read all the way through chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, 10, 11, 12. And by the way, there's some pretty hard things in this book. And then they come to the divine exclamation point. They come to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, and this is what the church at Corinth heard. Oh, what what help it must have brought to them. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Would you read it with me, please? Put your eyes on it. Would you read it with me? Ready? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Let's see if we can say it. You ready? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. It's amazing how when you concentrate on a verse, it gets in you, doesn't it? We memorize Scripture, not to say we memorize that. We memorize Scripture to meditate on it. And my prayer is that you'll meditate more and more on this verse in the days to come and make it your own prayer. It's an amazing verse. It introduces us, of course, again to the triune God, the thrice holy God, the Godhead. Uh, The part of the Godhead that I think we're most familiar with is the Son, the Lord Jesus, and perhaps we're most familiar with Him because He became a man. (laughs) He put on flesh. He lived among us. We read the gospel records and we get acquainted with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's wonderful because that's the starting point. You can't be a Christian without Christ. You cannot. You cannot know the Father without having Christ as your Savior. You cannot be indwelled by the Holy Spirit without having Christ as your Savior. If you want to be in the family of God, then you must come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's where we begin. And then the member of the Godhead that I think most people Uh, probably speak to most is the Father, our Father, which art in heaven. And then there is the third member of the Godhead, who, for the record, is no less God than God the Father and God the Son, co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal, and yet for some strange reason, he is the most neglected and misunderstood member of the Godhead. In fact, There's almost these extremes, and both of them are wrong. You know, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. Both of them are wrong. Like a pendulum on one end, you got people who who make things of the Holy Spirit that are not found in Scripture. They go beyond the Bible. (laughs) They're full of lots of excesses and lots of crazy things, and somebody says, what on earth? 
And I think the Lord must wonder that himself sometimes. What on earth are these people talking about? Because they have, they have created their own doctrine of the Holy Spirit, not the biblical doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But on the other side, on the other side, God help all of us. There's a whole bunch of people that are so scared to death to even talk about the Holy Spirit. It's just like we're going to leave that for somebody else. And those people, those people also err because they don't go beyond Scripture. They fall short of Scripture. I want to tell you tonight, I don't want to go beyond the Word of God, and I don't want to fall short of the Word of God. I want to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And if that's true, then we must come to know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about this this afternoon, but have you ever pondered the mutual humility and glory of the Godhead? Think about this for just a second. Just chew on this for a few days. Every time one member of the Godhead speaks, he's always speaking about the other. That's powerful to me. Let the Father speak, oh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. The Father speaks to the Son. Why did the Son come? The Son said, oh, I came to tell you all about the Father. And then the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit come to do? He doesn't come to speak of himself. He comes to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? Every member of the Godhead is, is lifting up the other. There's a, there's a beautiful humility, and yet there is a, a wondrous glory that must not be missed, the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son and the glory of the Holy Spirit. And the most glorious thing of all is that the God of all glory has made a way so that we could come to know him personally. They're little pipsqueaks like us. Peons, that's what we are. A speck of lint on the page of human history. A piece of dust in time. That's what we are. Everybody look at your neighbor just a second. Would you look at that person next to you? Do you know what you're looking at? A big ball of dirt. That's what you're looking at right there. God made man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Someday that body's going back to the dust of the ground and the spirit's returning to God who gave it. Oh, yes, my friend, we're just vessels of clay. That's all we are. And yet God in his glory has made a way. He pulled the curtain back and revealed himself. He's not playing hide and seek. He is revealing himself. If you really want to know God, you can come to know God. And how do we come to know God? We come to know God through his word. And in the verse, we not only get introduced to uh, this trinity, this triunity, the great three in one, but then we're also introduced to this beautiful trio, this, this thrice, three, three-part truth of what the Godhead brings to us. Look at the verse just a minute. I hope you've marked these three words in your Bible. We have grace. Anybody else glad we have grace tonight? Then we have love. And then we come to a most unique word tonight, communion. We understand the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming to understand the love of God, but now we must come to understand and apply, God help us now, the communion of the Holy Spirit. I've spoken to you about a son's grace and a father's love, and tonight I'd like to talk to you about a family fellowship because that literally is what the expression, the communion of the Holy Ghost means. It is a family word. Remember, we started our study early on the Lord's Day by talking about the perfect family, the original family, uh, the Godhead that lived in unbroken union and communion and charity and in unity and in eternity past. And now we, we come into that family. What do we find when we get there? No family like God's family. I don't know what your family's like. I don't know of any perfect families. The reality is most families have such problems at some point uh, that it just blows them out of the water and something about their life is just, you know, so, so difficult and so out of sorts. They think, I don't know what we're ever going to do. But I'm going to tell you, there's one perfect family, and that is the family of our great God. And the Lord has made a way so that we could know, look at the expression, mark it in your Bible, the communion of the Holy Ghost. I started preaching as a boy. As a matter of fact, I surrendered to preach. I was... 12 years of age. And I knew that's what God wanted. I knew he wanted me to be a preacher. Everybody didn't know that, that juncture in life, but I knew that for me. And matter of fact, I remember the night I surrendered to preach. It was a Thursday night. An old fellow that night in the mountains of West Virginia, an old preacher put his arm around me out in the lobby of the church, and he said, so, son, God's called you to be a preacher. I said, yes, sir. He said, great. Get your first sermon together. You're going to preach next week in a cottage prayer meeting. And I remember I, my eyes got big, and I said, hold up. Let's talk about this thing for a minute. And he said to me, if you don't start serving God now, you probably never will. And he was right. 
So I got my first sermon together. <laughs> I must have found an outline in a book somewhere. Pastor, do you know what I preached on the first sermon? First time I ever preached, I was 12. What on earth was I thinking? I preached on the Holy Spirit. I didn't really understand the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Just starting to learn some things about the Holy Spirit at this juncture in my life. But I preached on the Holy Spirit five, six, seven minutes, kind of stumbled and mumbled my way through something. I can still see it. I was in Mr. and Mrs. Logan's living room. He was dying of cancer, lying in a hospital bed because they, they couldn't come to church, so we brought church to them. And the room was filled with senior citizens. They were all sitting around the perimeter of the room, just smiling at me and nodding their heads and all that kind of thing. And it was pitiful. It was a pitiful sermon. Now, the subject matter was good because when you're speaking about God, it's always good, but the delivery was terrible. The presentation wasn't so hot. And when I finished, you know what they did? They all got in line, hugged my neck, shook my hand, told me it was the greatest sermon they'd ever heard in their life, and I was the next Billy Sunday. They lied to me. That's what they did. <laughs> they encouraged me. I was thinking about that this afternoon. I'm standing here now. It's a 45-year-old man. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me, please. All these years later, the Holy Spirit means more to me than I could possibly put into words. I love the Holy Spirit. And that may sound spooky or mystical to you. I'm not trying to sound spooky or mystical. It is spiritual. But the Holy Spirit's not an it. He's not a force. He's not a thing. He is a real person. And what's more, He is God living inside of every one of us. Think of this. God not only made a way so you could go live with him someday, but he could live with you today. How does he do that? Through the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of holiness. He is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of love. He is the Spirit of light. He is everything that God is living inside of us. And yet what a tragedy that most Christians live their whole life, study their Bibles even, and never come to know the God that's living inside of them. Do you think it would be an odd thing if somebody moved into your house and lived there for 40 years and you never got acquainted with them? Sounds like some marriages, doesn't it? But that's a different subject for another conference. Strangers living under the same roof shouldn't be that way. Do you think it odd that the Holy Ghost would come to live inside of your house? That's what he did if you trusted Jesus as your Savior. And yet we never speak to him. We never think about what he's trying to say to us. There, there is no communion of the Holy Ghost. I say to you, if you're going to grow and go on with God, you must learn something not only about Christ and the Father, but about the Holy Spirit of God. Well, a little interesting note before we start our, our study of this communion of the Holy Ghost tonight. Did you know that the church at Corinth is the only place in the Bible where the word communion is found. And it's found three times. Let me just show you, just for fun, all right, just for fun. Go back in your Bible for a second to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He's, he's dealing with the Lord's table, coming to the Lord's table. Matter of fact, some church groups refer to the Lord's Supper as communion. And perhaps this is where they get that term. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 16. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? I want you to mark in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, that word communion. And somewhere in the margin of your Bible, I want you to write the word fellowship. That's what he's talking about. Communion is not some spooky kind of thing. It's not something that some groups have made it to be where something magically happens to the bread and to the fruit of the vine. That's not what the word communion means. It was a word they understood in that day, and we need to understand today. It's a spiritual word, but it's a practical word. It is the word fellowship. How many of you know there's a difference between relationship and fellowship? For example, my wife and I got married. I told you we got married 25 years ago. And I said, I do, and I said, I love you, and that was all good. That established relationship. She put a ring on my hand, I put a ring on her hand. That established relationship. We said our vows and gave our kiss and went out the door, and that established relationship. But watch this, please. If 25 years later she and I never talk, are we living in good fellowship? No, we, we may be related, we may be married, we may be legally bound together, but we're not living in communion. We're not living in, in sweet fellowship and unity like we ought to. And I want to submit to you tonight that I think there's an army of Christians all over this country who put their faith in the Lord Jesus, who call God their Father, that have never learned to live in the communion of the Holy Ghost. They have relationship, but they have very little fellowship. 
Let me show you a second occasion. Turn back to 2 Corinthians and stop off in verse 6 for just a moment. This is, this is the second time you find the word communion. And now it gets real practical because it deals not only with your fellowship with him, but your fellowship with the world and your fellowship with others. Amazing how God starts on the inside and works his way out. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and be their God, and they should be my people. God said, if you say you're in fellowship with God, then you not ought be walking in fellowship with darkness at the same time. That's not possible. God is light, and in him is Excuse me, no darkness at all. You know why we don't have real revival? Because we, we want a whole lot of light and hold on to a little bit of darkness. And I want you to know, you can't walk in light and walk in darkness at the same time. Light never becomes darkness and darkness never becomes light. Flesh never becomes spirit and spirit never becomes flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And you're going to choose whether you're going to live by flesh or walk in the spirit. You're going to choose whether you walk in light or walk in darkness. The world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You're going to choose the will of God or this world that's passing away. But you've got to pick one because you can't have communion with both at the same time. Now come back to our verse, would you please? Because here's the third time where you find the word communion. And this time it brings us full circle back to the one that brings the fellowship. It is the communion of the Holy Ghost. Literally, we're brought into the unity and the sufficiency of the great three in one. What do we learn about the communion of the Holy Ghost? Would you write these truths down tonight? We're going to do something with them when we're finished, so pay real close attention, class. Number one, would you write this down? Communion, first of all, implies that we have something in common. You have something in common. You know, I travel every week. You know that. I'm in different places every week. I'm very often in places where I don't know anybody. I'll walk through the door. I may know the pastor. Sometimes I don't even know the pastor. And I walk through the door, and you feel like a little bit of a stranger. Maybe you're visiting tonight. I don't know who the visitors are, but maybe you're visiting tonight. And you think, well, we walked in. We really didn't know anybody and felt a little out of place. I'm going to tell you what I've discovered, though. When you really know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you get around other true followers of Jesus Christ, you might feel like a stranger for a moment, but in just a little bit, you're going to feel right at home because you're with family. See, when you have the same father, that gives you fellowship. You got a father, you got a family, and you got a fellowship when you took Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. See that person next to you? Look back at that person next to you. You know that ball of dirt you looked at a minute ago? Look at him again just for a second. You know really what you're looking at? Let me be nicer this time. You're looking at a brother or a sister in Christ. If you belong to the Lord and they belong to the Lord, guess what? We have Christ in common. You may say, I don't have anything in common with that person. Well, you have Jesus in common with that person. And by the way, family members ought to get along. Did you know there's a big family reunion being planned at the Father's house real soon? It's a big one. You've never seen, you've never seen anything like the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to spend eternity together. Maybe we ought to get a little practice in that kind of unity here on this side of glory. What do you think? So what does it imply? It implies we have something in common. Let me show you what I mean. Go back to Acts chapter 1 for just a second. This is where the Lord set all this in motion leading up to the day of Pentecost. Look at Acts chapter 1 with me and verse number 4. The Lord Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection, before his ascension. And look at verse 4. It says, and being assembled together with them. Isn't that a beautiful expression? Isn't it great to assemble with Christ and with Christ's people? Being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father... Which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. By the way, that day happened. That moment came. It's in the very next chapter. It's the day of Pentecost. It's the day the Holy Spirit of God, who has always been, came to indwell every believer. You know the first mention of the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Most people immediately, immediately go to the day of Pentecost. He didn't start at Pentecost anymore than Jesus started at Bethlehem. You know where the Holy Spirit started? He had no beginning. He's the eternal spirit, the everlasting spirit of God. 
But the first mention of him is way back in Genesis. Oh, I love this. The Bible says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. The word there, moved, literally means he hovered over the face of the waters. Can I tell you, that same Holy Spirit is still moving and hovering today. And by the way, I hear people say, well, you know, preacher, it's bad out there. It's bad. This world's bad. You know what everybody's favorite verse is right now? Everybody's favorite verse is, well, you know, preacher, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And I always say, yes. Do you know the next verse? But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Look, when God said the world was going to get bad, he never said the gospel was going to lose any of its power. No, friend. Do you know when the Holy Spirit first moved in Scripture, law first mentioned? When the earth was without form, void, and dark. That sounds encouraging, doesn't it? There was emptiness, there was chaos, and there was darkness, and that was the place where the Holy Spirit went to work, and God said light, and there was light, and it was very good. May I say to you, God can bring fullness out of emptiness and order out of chaos and light out of darkness, and if he did it in Genesis 1, he can do it in our day. The Holy Spirit of God has not lost his power. What's been lost is our understanding and dependence on the Holy Spirit. I took you to Acts 1 for a reason. Mark this in your Bible. In verse 4, I want you to mark Father. You see the Father? Then I want you to mark the word me. Who's speaking there? Christ is speaking. The Lord Jesus, the Son of God, is speaking. So in verse number 4, you've got the first two members of the Godhead. And then in verse number 5, I want you to mark the Holy Ghost. Isn't this beautiful? All three members of the Godhead again. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know what we have in common? We have our God in common. Look at chapter 2. Just flip over the one page. Look at chapter 2, verse 31. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. He makes the same emphasis. Look at verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. I want you to mark, please, if you will, please, in verse 32 and verse 33. Jesus the Father, the Holy Ghost. You see all three members of the Godhead here. It's powerful. What do we have in common? We have the Father in common. We are His children. We have Christ in common. He is our Savior. And we have the Holy Spirit in common. He indwells every one of us. By the way, you know what people want? Everybody want, wants the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But you listen to me. You cannot have the Holy Spirit as your comforter if you do not have Jesus as your Savior and God as your Father. You can't chop God up. You don't get a part of God when you get saved. You get all of God. Watch this, please. And God doesn't want a part of you. He wants all of you. And so the word communion, first of all, implies what we have in common. There's a second thing. Go back to the verse, the communion of the Holy Ghost, and write this down, that communion involves communication. That's deep, isn't it? <laughs> you can't commune with somebody without talking to them. If you call me a friend and I see you out on the street and we pass each other every day and I say hi and you never greet me, after a while I'm going to get at the idea that you're really not a friend. Because friends talk. And spouses talk. And those that love one another talk to one another. They communicate with one another. Do you know what communion is? Communion is the deepest level of communication. You can communicate with your mouth. You can communicate what's in your mind. Do you know what communion is? Communion is heart-level communication. It's more than knowledge. It's more than facts. Oh, I hate to say this, but there are people who are going to live and they're going to die in churches, and they're going to have heads full of all kinds of Bible knowledge, but they've never had that hard experience with the Creator God of the universe. They know all about God, but they don't know God. Do you know what communion is? Communion says that I really know Him, and I love talking to Him, and I love to hear His voice. If the Holy Spirit is a real person, He communicates. He actually communicates in several different ways. One, he talks to us. John chapter 16, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit that when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, but he's going to take the things of Christ and he's going to show them to us. Now, I'm not trying to be weird, but I want you to know I haven't been the preacher this week. You think I've been the preacher, but I haven't been the preacher. All I've been is the preacher's assistant this week. That's all I've been. 
I got to give the, the Bible message each night and point you to the Lord, but the real preacher is the person of the Holy Spirit, and it is his voice, actually, that's done the heart work if any heart work has been done. See, you can hear sermons, and you can nod your head, and you can even take notes, but there is a time when you know in a meeting that God has your undivided attention and that the Lord is after you, and you can't escape it, and you can't understand it, and you even go home, and the preacher's voice is silent, but the Word still lives inside of you. What is that? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking to every one of us. For the record, you don't have to have a revival meeting and a guest preacher for the Holy Spirit to speak to you either. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you every day of your life. How many of you would like to see this work that God has done in us this week? How many of you would like to see this continue and go on when the meeting's done? Would you raise your hand? I'm going to tell you how to do it. You get in the Word of God every day, and you say to God, God, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit would be my teacher and show me something from the Word of God. And I tell you, you come to the Scriptures that way, you won't be disappointed. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. Not only that, the Holy Spirit speaks for you. Did you know at this very moment the Holy Spirit is talking for you? Let me show it to you. Hold your place. We're coming right back. Hold your place. Go to Romans chapter 8 with me for just a minute. I love this. I just love the Word of God. What a book this is. Look at Romans chapter number 8, verse number 15. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. There's so many people living in fear right now. And by the way, it's not just worldly people living in fear. There's a lot of religious people living in fear. Because they don't understand this. Look, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Lift your head and look at it just a second. Does the Holy Spirit testify in you that you really are a Christian? I'm not asking what you say about it. I'm not asking what I say about it. I'm asking, do you have the inner witness of the Holy Ghost of God? I'm not talking about some... Uh, euphoric feelings, some chill up the spine. I'm not talking about that. Is there in you, when we speak of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the work of salvation, is there in you that inner witness, that person that says, oh yes, that's a living reality in your life? Last night, a lady sent a message to me online, and she said, I don't know, I don't remember all the details about the day I got saved. She said, but I just know this. I know I've trusted Christ alone for my salvation, and I know that I'm saved. You know, the only way somebody can say that with certainty is if the Holy Spirit inside them is bearing witness to that. Do you know that for sure? It's the spirit of adoption. Do you know there's only two ways you can come into a family? What's the two ways? Think. What's the two ways? Number one, you can what? Be born. What's the second way? You get adopted. I love this. God uses both of them in Scripture as a symbol of our salvation. When you come to Jesus, you get born again, and you are adopted into the family of God. Look, so by miraculous birth and by divine choice, at the same time, you become a member of the family of God. It's powerful, isn't it? Look at verse number 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Would you mark in verse 15, Father, in verse 16, Spirit, and in verse 17, Christ? Anybody starting to notice a pattern here? We're getting to know the Godhead, you see. The Father is our Abba. You see that word Abba? Somebody say, what kind of word is that? It's an actual word from the language of the day. And it was one of the most tender, intimate words for a father. I've heard some people preach and teach. That it's like saying Papa. It is that kind of intimate word, but it is not exactly like that. And I'm going to tell you why. It was also a word of such reverence and respect. It's a fascinating word in the language of the day. It was a word of reverence and of intimacy at the same time. Matter of fact, I just read the other day, just the other day, um, a preacher friend of mine said that, that he had a, a friend who traveled in Israel. He was in Tel Aviv for a meeting. And while he was there, he was in a certain public place, and he heard a Jewish father correcting his son. And he was, they were speaking in English. He was correcting his son, and he overheard him say to his son, when I tell you something like that, I want you to say, Abba. In other words, he was saying, we're close, we're intimate enough for me to correct you, for me to chasten you, but I want you to respond in kind. Did you know there's only one person in all of Scripture that ever said Abba? Anybody know who it is? Jesus did. That's exactly right. In the garden, he prays and he cries, Abba, Father. Watch this. Oh, this is glorious. When the Lord Jesus Christ became your Savior and brought you into the family of God, hallelujah, through Jesus, he gave you the same access 
to the Father's throne and the Father's heart that Christ himself has. That's powerful. Through the Lord Jesus, we have access. The Father's our Abba. Christ, he's our assurance. Now look, please, though, the Holy Spirit. Do you see the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is our advocate. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. You're in the same chapter. Come down, please, and look at verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You know what one of the first lessons of prayer is? That we don't know how to pray. When you think you know how to pray, you don't. You don't stretch your way in the presence of God. You don't bring your laundry list to God. You don't demand of God. In fact, I'm going to tell you, when you really get to the end of yourself and you say, Dear Lord, I don't even know what to say, I think it's at that moment, oftentimes, we're on the verge of the greatest level of prayer. Because that's the moment where we're really depending on the Holy Ghost to help us. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Be honest, be honest. Let's take a survey. How many of you ever prayed for anything that you look back on and think, that was not the will of God, what I asked for? Would you raise your hand? Is anybody else happy that God has not answered every prayer you've ever, ever asked him for? There have been many times that I have not prayed in the will of God, but there's never been a single time the Holy Spirit didn't pray in the will of God. Because the Holy Spirit not only knows my heart, I love this, He knows God's heart. And the Holy Spirit is your prayer line. He's, he's the prayer connection to heaven. And at this moment, the Holy Spirit is praying for every one of you. Every one of you. Look at me, please. The Holy Spirit is praying for every one of you. Oh, it thrills me. At this moment while I'm preaching, the Holy Spirit is praying for me. Now that will put some fresh courage and confidence in your soul. The Holy Spirit speaks to you, and the Holy Spirit speaks for you. A young man came to me some time ago at the end of a meeting. He was weeping, and he said, Preacher, he said, in the meeting tonight, he said, God really spoke to me. And he said, I came to the altar to talk to God. And he said, when I got there, he said, I just couldn't even put it in words. He said, I just wept. He said, all I could do is just sob. He said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I said, that's wonderful, son. He said, wonderful. I said, oh, yes. I said, God's tender to your heart. And he said to me, I'll never forget this. He said, preacher, he said, I couldn't even talk. All I could do was cry. He said, you think the, the, the Lord understood that? And I said to him, understood it? He liked it. Because when you get to the place where all you have is just, just the groan of your own heart, the Holy Spirit is praying for you at that moment. What is this? This is deep communion with the Lord. Oh, may God take us further with Him and deeper in our prayer lives than we've ever been. This, this is the way to know the communion of the Holy Ghost. There's one more thing He communicates. He not only speaks to you and for you, I like this one, He speaks through you. Back in Acts chapter 1, where we were a minute ago, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, then you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Do you know what I pray before I get up to preach? Every time I preach, I pray it. I try to pray it without fail. I try to pray it many times through the day. I don't always do that like I ought to. You know what I pray? I pray this, dear Lord, please fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not asking for the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. But I'm asking at that moment that the Holy Spirit of God would have all there is of me and that he would be in complete control of my life. Do you know what I fear? I fear that far too many of God's children have the Holy Spirit as a resident in their life, but he is not controlling their life. And I wonder tonight, are you a spirit-filled Christian? Sir, we don't need more people taking up room in a church pew. And ma'am, we don't just need more members on the roll. And young people, we don't just need more people in Sunday school. I'm going to tell you what churches need. They need more spirit-filled members. And I'm going to tell you what a community like this needs. It needs more spirit-filled witnesses. And when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not evidenced in all kinds of nonsense. You get filled with the Holy Spirit, you will have wisdom, and you will have boldness, and you will have a desire to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. In fact, I'll go so far as to tell you this. If you have no desire to witness, no compulsion at all to share your faith and point people to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are not living a spirit-filled Christian life. Because the Holy Spirit came to do one thing. I didn't say this, Jesus did. Read the Gospel according to John. He came to do one thing, and that was to testify of Jesus Christ and glorify and lift up Christ. I'm going to tell you what the Holy Ghost wants to talk about. He wants to talk about Jesus. And when you start talking about Jesus, he'll speak up and start talking about Jesus to people too. You may talk to their ears, but the Holy Spirit will start talking to their hearts. Why? Because the communion of the Holy Ghost means the Holy Spirit is speaking. Let's go back to our verse. Let me give you another truth. Would you write it down? 
Communion not only implies what we have in common and involves communication, but number three, communion indicates that it is to continue. You know why I believe this is saved for last? Because this is the lasting emphasis the Lord wants us to take away from the verse. It's a divine order. It begins the entry point of knowing Christ, and then we come into a deeper understanding of the love of God. But how does this go on and on and on and extend in our everyday life? Through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. I wonder, how well do you know the Holy Spirit? How well do you know him? I don't mean just academically. I mean personally, experientially. How well do you know the Holy Spirit? If nothing else happens as a result of this meeting tonight, I'm going to tell you what I'm praying. I'm praying there'll be some people in this room who get hungry after God again and say, Lord, I've lived a mediocre existence long enough, an average kind of Christianity, an American form of Christianity. I want to know the God of the Bible, and I want him to control every area of my life. That shouldn't stop at the end of the meeting. That should begin in this meeting, and it should continue until we see Jesus face to face. Let me give you one more, and I'm done. Communion invites us to draw closer to Him. Matters not how much you know, how long you've been saved. The Lord's invitation is nearer, nearer, closer to God. There is always more for us to know and always room for us to grow. So let me just really get down where you live for a moment and ask you, what's the next step for you? Probably somebody in this room is not sure you're saved. It is not even sure you're saved. I'm going to tell you the next step for you. You can't take another step till you settle this step. You need to put your faith in Jesus tonight. Settle it. Just settle it once and for all. Christ and Christ alone. Not a church, not my baptism, not my good works, not my family heritage, none of that. Look, I grew up in a preacher's home. We were in church all the time. Moral people did our best. God baptized a child. But I'm going to tell you something. Apart from Jesus, I'd go to hell, and so will every other sinner, because you must personally receive Christ as your Savior. You must be born again. Jesus said that. So that's the next step for some of you. Some of you have been saved and you've never been baptized. You say you want to follow the Holy Spirit? You can't follow the Holy Spirit and disobey what God says to do. You need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. That's what you need. Some of you have been saved and baptized, and that's as far as it's ever gone for you. You've not really been, gotten involved in church. You've been on the periphery. It's time for you to get heart deep in what God's doing through the local New Testament church. For some of you, it's a renewed devotion to God in His Word and in prayer. For some of you, it's grabbing some gospel literature and saying, by the grace of God, I've never done much of it, and I'm not real good at it, but I'm going to witness to somebody this week and tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. I don't know what it is. I'm not trying to fill in the blanks. I'm not God to you. I'm just saying, for everybody in this room, there is a next step, and the communion of the Holy Ghost invites us to come on, keep following Jesus, take the next step. Let's get a little nearer to what God saved us to become. The word communion here literally means to share. Are you glad God shares? Let me ask that one again. Are you glad God shares? Well, everything's His. You ought to be glad He shares. He shares air. Take a breath. Isn't that nice? He shares food, sunshine, sometimes some rain. He shares this bird singing. Thank you, Lord. He shares a measure of strength and health. He extends it. He sustains it. It's all the Lord. He shares every spiritual thing. Wisdom. You need wisdom? He'll share. (laughs) Are you weak? He's got lots of strength. He'll share. Are you sinful? He's holy. He'll share. Every good thing in Him, He shares. There's only one thing the Bible says He won't share. He won't share His glory. It's the only thing. You, look, you start robbing God of glory, it's done. The minute anybody takes credit for what God does at that moment, the Lord removes the blessing. But watch, please. Outside of His glory, He'll share everything. And do you know how He shares it? Through the Holy Spirit. Oh, don't miss this church. The communion of the Holy Ghost is not what we share with Him. It's what He shares with us. In fact, I got nothing to give Him. And you don't either. And as long as we think we do, we're just full of us. And you can't be full of you and full of the Holy Spirit at the same time. Would you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Then you must come to God and say, Oh, Lord, I don't want to just say I'm a Christian. Oh, Lord, I don't want to just point to a day I got saved. Oh, Lord, I don't want to just go to church. I don't want to bide time till I die. Oh, Lord, I want to be filled with the communion of the Holy Ghost.
Let me illustrate for just a minute. Excuse me. Hope I put good socks on tonight. I think I did. I did, praise God. Look here just a second. See that shoe? It's a nice shoe, isn't it? All shined up, polished for church. That shoe is bought and paid for. I'm making payments on other things, but these are paid for. Aren't you glad about that? It's a nice shoe. Get up and walk to the back of the auditorium. I said, get up and walk down the aisle to the back of the auditorium. How many of you think we're going to be here a while? Somebody said, preacher. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. But fill it with me. And suddenly, it does whatever I tell it to do. I'm going to tell you what we got. We got churches filled with people, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, all spit, shined, and polished for church, sitting on church pews, listening to guys like me scream at them every Sunday, trying to get them to do something for the Lord, and they're not budging. There's not so much as a stinking holy grunt coming out of them. And you know why? Because they've never learned to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you let that same Christian get full of God. I tell you, they'll go wherever God tells them to go. They'll do whatever God tells them to do, and they'll say whatever God tells them to say. You know what it is? It's the communion of the Holy Ghost. I was thinking earlier today, I told you last night the story of D.L. Moody. Remember the story of Mr. Moody sitting on the front row and getting taken with the love of God? and It's powerful. Moody said one afternoon he was speaking in a children's rally, a big, big meeting, lots of young people, and he got up and gave the gospel, and he did well. He did really well. And a bunch of children came to faith in Christ, and everybody just thought, oh, that's the greatest thing we've ever seen. And Moody said, and I was pretty proud of it. Moody slipped out the side door to get in a carriage. They were taking him across town to speak in yet another church meeting. He was busy for the Lord. He was going. He was getting something done. He was full of him. He said he got ready to get up in that carriage and hand stopped him. He said he looked down, looked next to him, and there was a little old man standing there. He said, I've never seen the fellow before. I had no idea who he is, and I've never seen him since. He said he had tears in his eyes, and he said to me, Young man, when you speak again, honor the Holy Ghost. Moody said, I didn't even know what he meant. He said, to be honest with you, he said, I got in my carriage and rode off, and he said, I was offended. I was offended. I mean, I just preached the gospel, and young people were saved, and everybody said I did a good job, and I felt pretty good about it. What's that old man mean, honor the Holy Ghost? He said, but I couldn't get away from it. And he said, for months after that, he said, I'd lay in bed at night, and all I could hear was that old man. Young man, when you preach again, honor the Holy Ghost. Moody would give his own testimony about how he came walking down Wall Street one day in New York City under such deep conviction of his weakness and inability and the greatness of God and the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. And he found a room where he could be alone with God. And he said, my life was changed. And he said, suddenly, a God who had been so distant seems so near and the Holy Spirit's work in my heart so alive. And he said, the most amazing thing happened. He said, I went back to the same places to preach. He said, I preached the same sermons. He said, and this time, instead of there being a few people saved, he said, hundreds of people got saved. And he said, I remember one night I was speaking and God was blessing. And he said, I heard that old man in my mind again. Honor the Holy Ghost. And Moody said, I learned something that night I've tried to apply to this day. He said, I realized when you honor God, God will allow you to see and share in what he is doing in this world. And I'm going to tell you, you think this is great? Friend, we hadn't scratched the surface of what God could do. If we would get in step with God and the communion of the Holy Ghost.